بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Alhamdulillah, we have tawfiq to continue our reflections on Surah Al-Jumu'ah. Last week we talked about the beginning of the Surah. A little bit about Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Then we talked about the concept of Tasbih. And I promised to bring the book on Tasbih, Alhamdulillah, this year. And then we started with the second ayah. Mubin. We said there are four verses in the Quran that mention these three tasks for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tilawatul Ayat, Ta'alimul Kitab wal Hikmah, and Tazkiyah, Purification of the Souls. These three are mentioned in four verses of the Quran. And we said one of them is Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail. In Surah Baqarah, Verse 129, we have Rabbana wabaath fihim rasulam minhum yatlu alayhim ayatik wa yu'allimuhum ul kitab wal hikmah wa yuzakkihim innaka anta al azizul hakim. So, centuries before the Prophet, they were inspired by Allah because I think this dua was inspired to ask for coming of this messenger in their progeny. Because they said, وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ refers to the progeny or to the ummatan muslimatan among the progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail. The only difference is that in this ayah, Surah Baqarah 129, which is Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail, Tilawa comes first, Ta'alimul Kitab wal Hikmah, teaching the book and wisdom comes second, Tazkiyah comes third. But in three other verses of the Quran that Allah Himself refers to this Prophet and His task, He mentions the three but with a difference in the order, like Surah Jumah. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكْ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ الْحَكْمَةِ So Tazkiyah comes before تَعْلِيمُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحَكْمَةِ Otherwise the three are there. One is Surah Baqarah 129, one is Surah Baqarah 151, one is Surah Al-Jum'ah 2, one is Ali Imran 164. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ذَلَالٍ مُبِينَ Ayah in Surah Al-Imran is very similar to Ayah in Surah Jum'ah. Even the ending, وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ذَلَالٍ مُبِينَ They why there is a difference? Is it because the order doesn't make difference in order to show that it can be the other way? Allah has used both. This is one interpretation. But the other interpretation is that maybe although what they asked was correct, but a better order, which we have in three out of four, is to bring Tazkiyah before Ta'lim. Why? Because 
teaching the book and wisdom is not like teaching maths and physics. Yeah? For teaching maths and physics, you don't need the heart to be pure, the soul to be purified. Yeah? Any person can learn. Of course, those with pure heart can understand better, but any person, even a person who is not moral, who is vicious, can learn these subjects, can teach these subjects, can become you know, great experts in these subjects, because these are secular subjects. Even when it comes to Islamic subjects, if it is just the theoretical side, even a non-Muslim can learn. Even a moral person who is non-Muslim or immoral person can learn. But Ilmul Kitab is different. Ilmul Kitab is of a different type. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about the story of Prophet Sulaiman. Prophet Sulaiman asked who can bring the throne of the Queen of Saba. Qala ifritun min al jinn ana atika bihi qabla an taquma min makanik. There was an old jinn. He said, I will bring it before you stand up or before this meeting is over. I will bring it in a matter of a few minutes. I can bring it. Because jinns can move fast and can also you know, move things fast. But there was another offer which was better. The other offer was by someone who had ilmun min al kitab, some knowledge of the book. Before your eyes blink, I will bring it. You know, immediately, almost immediately. This person had ilmun min al kitab, some knowledge of the book. And this Al-Kitab is the hidden book, or you can say the common source of all the scriptures. Yeah? Torah, Injil, Quran, they all come from Al-Kitab. I have a, a lecture about this, about the concept of the book in the Quran. And my understanding is that the Quran sometimes uses Al-Kitab in the way that is singular always. How many books Allah sent? We say Allah sent many books. Yeah? But the reality is that if you want to be very precise, very accurate according to the Quranic standards, Allah sent only one book. We have different books, but Allah sent only one book. In several places, Allah says, جَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُّهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالزُّبُرِ وَالْكِتَابِ الْمُنِيرِ Not وَالْكُتُبِ الْمُنِيرِ Rusul is plural, plural for Rasul. Messengers brought bayyanat, is plural, clear signs. Zubur writes or, you know, texts. Wal Kitab al Munir, illuminating book, not Al Kutub al Munira. Therefore, we don't say Ya Ahl al Kutub, we say Ya Ahl al Kitab. Okay? But the thing is that we have among people different books. Because our understanding is more focused on the differences. So we say we have Torah, we have Injil, we have Quran, we had Sofa Ibrahim, etc. But these are different editions of the same book, different versions of the same book. Therefore, when Quran refers to people, says, Amana Rasul Bima Unzila Ilayhim and Rabbihi wal Mu'minun Kulun Amana Billah wa Kutubihi wa Rusuli. But when Allah refers to what He did, He says, جَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْزُبُرِ وَالْكِتَابِ الْمُنِيرِ So, 
We are all Ahlul Kitab. Even Muslims, from Quranic perspective, are Ahlul Kitab. We all believe in that holy book from which Torah has been given like a version. Injil, Quran, etc. That hidden book is the source for the Quran, for Torah, for Injil. Of course, these versions by the passage of time have become more and more developed. You know, imagine you have, for example, one encyclopedia. But it can have different editions. Maybe earlier editions were with less details. Maybe they didn't have color images. But the same title, the same author. Who is the author of this book? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the same author for the same humanity, but different editions according to the needs of the time. So, Al-Kitab is something beyond just learning how to read the Quran or even how to, you know, uh, teach the Quran. Al-Kitab means to have something which is hidden, which is well protected. Al-Nahu la Quranun Karim fi kitabin mahfuz. That book is mahfuz, loh mahfuz. And with purity, you can get access. La yamassuhu illa al mutahharun. Only people who are purified can touch it. Okay? Therefore, we find that in our hadith, ilmul kitab is very highly regard regarded and it is one of the you know, qualities of the prophets and imams, or in particular, Ahlul Bayt alayhum as Quran says, قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ الشَّهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ It's sufficient for me that Allah is witness between me and you and the one who has ilmu al-kitab. Who is the one who has ilm al-kitab? By having some knowledge of the book, that person was able to bring the throne immediately almost. What about someone who has ilm al-kitab? And there must be such a person because Quran says there is such a witness. So we ask all Muslims and non-Muslims who have studied early Islam, please tell us who was the witness who was not the prophet, because witness should be someone else. Who was that witness that had ilmul kitab? Any person has one candidate, you know, please mention. Even our Sunni brothers, they don't say their caliphs had ilm al-kitab. Yeah? They don't say they had you know, all the knowledge of the book. No one says. If the, anyone has any candidate, is the Shia who have candidate. That their candidate by all is accepted to be the most knowledgeable companion and follower of the Prophet. So ilm al-kitab is something very special, very high. And this is in need of preparation. It needs first to be purified, and then you can get this knowledge. And knowledge of Al-Kitab also comes with Al-Hikmah, with wisdom. One of the beauties of the Quran is that Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah are connected. I read for you some verses of the Quran to see that Everything is very well explained in the Quran. It's not, you know, by chance. Not only in these f four cases we have ta'lim al-kitab wal hikmah but we have it in other places. For example, in Surah Nisa, verse 54, 
Allah says, Am yahsudun an nas ala ma atahum Allah min fadli. Are they jealous about what Allah has given from His fadl, from His favor? Inshallah, we talk about fadl later. Zalika fadlullah yu'tihim an yasha. So. They shouldn't be jealous if Allah makes someone prophet or messenger. فَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ We have given the family of Ibrahim al-kitab wal-hikmah. So this is a legacy in the house of Ibrahim. That we have people, not every person, because from Quranic perspective, you know, every person is not family of someone. Yeah? Who is Ali Ibrahim? Every child who was born in that family? No. Son of Nuh was not his family. From Quranic perspective, from a spiritual perspective, from biological, ex- yes. If someone has your DNA, you know, it can be your child. But from a spiritual perspective, someone's child is the one who resembles him, follows him. Therefore, uh, when we had uh, reflections on ziyara of Lady Masuma salamu alayha, I said, you need to really think about this. When we say, As-salamu alayka ya bint waliyillah, it means that she is someone that can be considered as true daughter of waliyillah. Not just biological daughter. She is daughter of Waliullah. She is Amma to Waliullah. And she is Ukhdu Waliullah. If someone can play all these roles truly and perfectly, then you can understand the caliber. So, who are Ali Ibrahim? The people who follow Ibrahim completely. Not the people that are just born to that family. So, Allah says, we gave the family of Ibrahim al-kitab wal-hikmah. This al-kitab is not possible to come without wisdom. Because it's not theoretical. What is wisdom? This is one of my most favorite topics, you know, wisdom. And the very first lectures we had in English in the Shrine of Lady Masuma was on wisdom. Wisdom is a knowledge which is related to the realities of the life. You can have general knowledge, but has nothing to do with your real life. This is not called hikmah. Hikmah has to be something concrete, something relevant, something practical. Okay? For example, we know that making a mosque is very good. Yeah? As long as this mosque is there, for generations, you get sawab if you make a mosque. This is general knowledge that we know. Now, you go to an alim, I say, you know, alhamdulillah, we have some money, resources, and we want to make a mosque. Is it good? Says, if he has knowledge, he says, of course. And he gives for you some hadith about merits of building a mosque. If he's alim. But if he is alim and hakim and wise, he wouldn't just say, you know, yes, it's very good. He said, tell me more about your city. Do you have any other mosque there or not? How many people are there? Do you have other, you know, things? Sometimes we have many mosques, but we don't have any school. Yeah? Sometimes we have schools and mosques, but we don't have, for example, orphanage. Hakim doesn't just give you a general answer. It's only like a physician. Physician is not the one who studies only, you know, medicine. Physician has also to see you and has to examine you and then out of thousands of medicines says this is what is good for you yeah? if the physician you know in the past we used to call even doctors you know hakim because they had to have wisdom 
He cannot say, you know, this is the, all the shelves of the pharmacy you can take anything. They are all good. They are all approved. <laughs> what is good for me? Maybe some of those good things for me is poison now. Yeah? Like, for example, maybe someone is too hopeful. We need to give him enzar and warning. Maybe someone is too hopeless. We just need to encourage him. Yeah? We cannot, you know, give everything to everyone. Therefore, it's very good to have people that know us and give us more specific information. And this is hikmah. So, hikmah is something which is rooted in knowledge, but reaching us to realities of life that we face. And we need hikmah more than we need knowledge. Because if we have a hikmah, we know where to get also knowledge. If you are a wise person and you are not expert, you know how to get knowledge. But if you have knowledge and no hikmah, if you are yourself expert but no hikmah, you cannot benefit. So hikmah is very important. And one of the titles of Quran is Al-Hakim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, Quran has two faces. Quran has two faces. One face is words. We have 114 surahs. We have some 6,000 uh, 6, uh, ayah. So this is words. We can read, we can reflect. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ Maybe you can understand. But this is the face that is given to us. But Quran has another face, which is facing Allah. وَإِنَّهُ فِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ لَدَيْنَا but Quran is in Ummul Kitab close to us. And Quran is Ali and Hakim. Quran is high and wise. So Quran has not left Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come to us. You know, it's not like rain. When rain descends, when you have Nuzul al Matar, rain is no longer in the sky. Rain comes down to us. Yeah? But when Quran comes, Quran comes to us without leaving there, without departing. And this is why then it can connect us. It is habl. Because it has two sides that we can hold on to the Quran and rise towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Quran is hakim. Quran has wisdom. And this is the source of wisdom. So ta'alim al-kitab wal-hikmah is something very important. Allah says, Atayna ala Ibrahim al kitab wal hikmah. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Isa alayhi salam, Surah Al Imran, verse 48. Wa al kitab wal hikmah. Wa tawrata wal injil. Allah teaches Isa alayhi salam the book and wisdom. This al kitab, as I said, is a common source. And then it says, at Torah, Torah and Injil. Allah taught Jesus Torah and Injil, but more generally and more fundamentally, Al Kitab Al Hikmah. <coughs> Surah Nisa also we have Anzalallahu Alaik Al Kitab Al Hikmah. Allah says to the Prophet that He sent down to you Al Kitab Al Hikmah. Surah Baqarah, Wama Anzal Alaikum Min Al Kitab Al Hikmah. So, the connection between Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah is very important. I saw uh, some Mufassirin have said Al-Hikmah is referring more to Aql, to intellectual aspect, and Al-Kitab to the revelation. But I think this can be correct in some places. But in the Quran, this Al-Hikmah is again about the book. Because it's Anzal al-Kitab al-Hikmah. This Hikmah is not intellectual 
uh, you know, science or philosophy, etc. This al-hikmah is related to the book. This book brings wisdom. It's part of the teaching of this book that it gives wisdom to those who follow it. Khub. If al-kitab and hikmah are so high that Allah says to the prophet that he gave him a book and hikmah, Allah says to Jesus that he gave him kitab and hikmah, to Ab Ali Ibrahim, then now imagine what great is the task of Rasulullah that he wants also to pass on this al-kitab and hikmah to us. He received from Allah al-kitab and hikmah, but he wants now to teach us Al-Kitab Al-Hikmah. So it's not easy. It needs purification. Therefore, in three places, Allah brings Tazkiyah to Nafs before Ta'alim Al-Kitab Al-Hikmah. So maybe this is a kind of uh, change and correction for the order of Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail. Maybe they didn't observe the order. They just said what is needed, but Allah puts it in the right order. So, Talawatul Ayat. Yatlu alayhim ayat. Even this Talawatul Ayat needs some discussion. <coughs> Maybe sometime we can talk about it. I think Talawatul Ayat is not just to read the Quran. Talawatul Ayat means that you are able to find out how to help people with the revelation, with these verses. If I always, you know, for example, read the same surah for people, I am not doing tilawatul ayat in this sense. Although I am reciting the Quran, but tilawatul ayat means to help people in their spiritual progress. And therefore, the person who is doing this telawa has to know this book well, know the problems of people, know the solution, and uses this, uh, you know, collection of beautiful verses very uh, specifically. If people, for example, suffer from, I don't know, mm, social issues, I need to recite verses of the Quran that address these issues. I cannot read, you know, things which are irrelevant. So Tilawatul Ayat is a very great task that you can bring Quranic guidance with respect to the problems that people face. Tazkiyatul Nafs wa Ta'alimul Kitab wa Al-Hikmah. One of the beautiful points in the Quran is that the Prophet not only was given the task of Tazkiyatul Nafs, he was also taught how to do Tazkiyatul Nafs. How the Prophet was doing Tazkiyatul Nafs. You can talk a lot about this. But the summary of it is this, that Tazkiyatul Nafs means to free the soul from impurities. Yeah? There are impurities that can affect our soul. What are those impurities? They are not physical or material impurities in the sense of there is a virus, there is a microbe. No, these are spiritual. For example, greediness, selfishness, jealousy. Yeah? These are impurities that can affect our soul then our soul cannot function properly. But the root of all these problems is Love for dunya, for the sake of dunya. If you look at dunya as a means for akhirah, that's good. Yeah? If you love your car because it helps you, you can go to mass, you can go to work, you can you know, take your children out. You love your car because it helps you as a means. But if you love your car independently, then you cannot even use it. Because if I use it, it becomes you know, older, it becomes dirty. I just you know, watch it and take care of it. Then this car has become an ideal for you. It's become you know, not a means, it's an end for you. This is a problem. So, 
حب الدنیا از an end is a problem is the root of all the problems so Allah says to the prophet خذ من اموالهم صدقه take from these believers صدقه تو تحرهم و تو زکیهم بها by taking صدقه you purify them because they are attached to dunya and when they are to give sadaqa from what they love little by little attachment will go away therefore i always say sadaqa should be something which is you know somehow painful to give <laughs> because if you want to work you know like for example they say if you want to do exercise you should do it in the way that you know your breathing is different if you walk very slowly it has little impact if you want to give sadaqa and get rid of hubbud dunya you should give something that you are attached to it lan tanalul bir hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun you must have attachment to it so if i have you know 1 million pound and i give 1 pound it doesn't work that much because it's easy for me i have to give and everyone is different I have to see what is very much, you know, dear to me and give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, method of tazkiyah is also mentioned and one of it is sadaqah. Khuz min amwalihim sadaqah. Tutahiruhum wa tuzakihim bih. Wa in kanu min qablu lafi zalalin mubin. These people that Rasulullah was teaching them these are called Ummiyin. Huwa allazi ba'atha fil Ummiyin. Even Rasulullah himself also is described as Ummi. And Rasul is called as Nabi al-Ummi. What does it mean Ummi? Ummi comes from Umm. Umm is mother. Some Mufassirin say, it means that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not educated by anyone as a teacher except family, except mother. He didn't go to any school. One of the wise plans of Allah for Rasulullah was that he didn't read or write anything, okay? He was, we believe that he was able to read and write, but he never wrote and read. مَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابِ وَلَا تَخُدْتُهُ بِيَمِينِكِ إِذَنْ لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْتَلُونَ Allah says, you never read anything before Quran and never wrote down anything before Quran because if you had done so, مُبْتَلُون, those who are after falsehood, they would say, he has learned these things from another source. This is not word of God. But someone who has not gone to any school, has not had any teacher, and uh, speaks about uh, you know, such things, this is more convincing for people that even are very difficult in accepting things. So, Ummi means illiterate according to one interpretation. And people of Mecca also in general, they were illiterate. For them, literature mostly was oral. But, you know, writing and, you know, going to a school and, you know, have books and library, print books, this kind of thing, this was not part of their culture. So these are Ummiyin and Rasulullah is one of them. Another opinion is that Ummi refers to Ummul Qura because Mecca is Ummul Qura, is the mother of other inner cities. So someone from Mecca is Ummi. This is another interpretation. A third interpretation is that Ummi is opposite to Chetabi. For example, the Jews were considering people of Mecca as Ummi, because they didn't have knowledge about uh, scriptures. They didn't have knowledge about divine books, or in our saying, in divine book. So they are considered as Ummi. 
and we have verses of the Quran about this. Actually, or at least just one verse of the Quran, but we can say more than one. So there are different interpretations, but maybe uh, the easiest one is to say that he was not reading and writing, he was illiterate. He was a person that <coughs> got his information and knowledge when it's for worldly things from home and when it is for revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ذَلَالِ الْمُبِينَ refers to the general situation of people of Mecca. These people of Mecca that Allah raised to them, the Prophet, they suffered from ignorance. We say that was the age of Jahiliyyah. Yeah? They had lots of superstitious ideas. And even although they had inherited the tradition of Hajj and Tawaf from Ibrahim, but so much of polytheistic ideas and superstitious ideas got into it that instead of Kaaba being a place for Tawheed, it was a place for storing their idols. They were doing Tawaf, but in a very wrong way. They used it as a way for trade. For example, if you are not from Mecca, you cannot use your dress. Either you do tawaf nakedly or you buy your dress from Mecca. They made, you know, things in order to benefit. <coughs> you know about the way they were attacking, looting other tribes. They were killing their daughters, you know, alive. So they had lots of problems. And Allah honored them by sending a messenger from the same people from the same men and him to guide them. But is it only for people of Mecca? Was Islam only sent for the people of Mecca? No. And there are others that have not yet joined them. Many other people soon embraced Islam. And now we have people you know, even today, we were not there, but we were meant in discussion about Quran. I always say Quran was revealed at the time of the Prophet, but Allah talked to us as well. Allah had us also in his knowledge. It makes a big difference. You know, sometimes I say, this book is given to this person, but I can read and see what is, you know, relevant. And, but sometimes I say, this book is written for him and me. Allah sent Quran for us as well. We have share. Every human being can benefit from this Quran without thinking that I am a secondary person. Hakim. And he is Aziz and Hakim, like the first ayah, Al Azizul Hakim. And also in Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail was Al Azizul Hakim. He is Aziz. So he can make sure that his plans are not stopped or blocked by anyone. He has power and he achieves what he wants. And he is Hakim. He does everything for a purpose. He doesn't do anything without purpose. Inshallah, we will continue this discussion after two weeks, inshallah. Not next week, the week after, inshallah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us knowledge of the Quran and light of the Qur'an, and shafa of the Qur'an, inshallah, in the hereafter. Amin, ya Rabbil Alameen.